Hello, I'm Norbek Svitakhunov and you're watching news from Kazakhstan. A Kazakhstan citizen is among more than 170 people killed in the Kuban. The Rostov agency Don News reports the body of 49-year-old Yevgenia Slabukova was transported from Gelenjik back home. Prior to that, the woman was considered a Rostovite. On Wednesday, July 11th, Russian rescuers refused the help of Kazakhstan's Ministry of Emergency Situations, reported Minister Vladimir Boshko. Boshko says that Russian colleagues are handling the situation well. They thanked him for the empathy, but at this point they don't need outside help. In any case, Kazakhstan is always ready to assist, emphasized the official. The minister was immediately asked about the situation in the country because strong floods happen locally in the spring as well, in particular in the southern and western parts of the country. Speaking about the alarm system to warn the population about potential flooding threats, Boshko said the ministry is doing all it can, but is not always capable of predicting the scale of a disaster. When it rains, it rains, and only God knows how much water we are getting. It could be hail the size of pigeon eggs, like it was in Zaisan, or a simple steady drizzle. Look at the recent disaster when a seven-month precipitation volume fell in mere one and a half hours. The soil just couldn't absorb it all, especially with all the water coming down from the mountains. The emergency warning system in Almaty will be tested on July 25th, when a fake earthquake alert will be issued at 10 a.m. Yesterday, the emergency minister also met with MPs Nurlan Abdirov and Viktor Ragalov, reporting to them about fire safety issues and completed rescue works. The MPs inquired whether the agency is prepared to handle a blaze in one of Astana's high-rises. Ministry representatives said they will tackle the fire with KA-32 choppers and 88-meter-long expandable ladders, although it has already failed once before when the transportation ministry caught on fire several years ago. The emergency personnel also informed the MPs that together with the health ministry, they have developed a traffic accident risk map. First aid stations will be set up at locations most prone to such accidents. One area, dubbed the Bermuda Triangle, is a part of the Astana Almaty Highway, passing through the Shed District. The Ministry of Internal Affairs reported on Wednesday the criminal case against the border guard who fatally shot a passerby near the South Kazakhstan border post in Tamak has stopped. Instead, a pre-investigation check has been appointed. According to the official lead, on June 24th in Kokterek village, unknown people attacked a lieutenant of the border service, who started shooting into the air and at the wheels of the attacker's car in self-defense. What remains unclear is why the officer was in possession of a weapon in civilian clothes outside the border gates. The Interior Ministry official representative commented on another accident in the Almaty region, confirming that a policeman took part in a bar fight. The day before, a shooting was reported in a cafe in Koktoma town of the Almaty region. Local residents say the officers were first to open fire. Hiding a smile, the ministry spokesman said that three policemen were indeed in the area on a business trip and had to respond to hooligans disturbing public order at night. The men threatened police officers and then hit one of them with a blunt object from behind. Also, a rock was thrown at a policeman during the ensuing pursuit. The officer is currently in the hospital. A criminal case has been started, and we will closely monitor it. The UN High Commissioner for Human Rights appealed to the Kazakh authorities to allow an international investigation of Janazian events. Navanathan Pillai noted that the trials should follow international norms and standards in the protection of human rights and provide a fair trial, particularly in accordance with Article 14 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. The Commissioner also expressed concern about the fact that there had been no proper investigation of the events in Janazian. Pillai first arrived on a visit to Kazakhstan on Wednesday. The initial meetings were held in Almaty, where the commissioner spoke with Minister of Foreign Affairs, Yerjan Kazakhanov. Thank you very much, um, Minister. And this is a very important opportunity for me. Um, we had a very good meeting, and I personally commended you for coming to Geneva. I saw the significance of your visit is Kazakhstan support for human rights. Navanathan Pillai will spend two days in the country. On Wednesday, she also met with NGO representatives, although behind the closed doors. It is known that Janosian events were discussed during the meeting. The High Commissioner will give a press conference in Almaty on Thursday. She will also meet with Vice Prime Minister, Minister of Justice and Prosecutor General. The Commissioner is planning to discuss a wide range of issues, including the citizens' rights to peaceful assembly. The previous UN High Commissioner, Louise Arbour, visited Kazakhstan five years ago. Meanwhile, the situation with the arrested Alha party leader Vladimir Kozlov in the Aktau city jail remains unclear. 
In a new twist, his wife and public defender Alia Torzbiakova followed the example of director Yermek Tursunov. Following the unexpected release of public activist Bolat Atabaev, Turzbekova spent the entire day trying to hand in her petition to the representatives of the NSC investigation team. This, however, was a difficult task. No one was at the office in the morning. Investigator Baldairov was nowhere to be found, and the NSC Mangistao's regional department asked all visitors to return after lunch. The petition, though, was submitted eventually. At the same time, Turzbekova says it is also very hard to find out about any of the made decisions, since no one in the committee ever answers their phones. I cannot say anything about him now. When I saw him the last time, he was generally all right, but this was a month ago. As for recent news, I got a call from lawyers representing Vladimir and Sidik Sapargali, who were urgently summoned to Aktau. They will go there on Thursday. Perhaps there will be some investigative activities, and the preliminary investigation could be announced as completed. Aliyat Rozbekova also talked about Balata Tabayev's release. Some of the charges filed against the stage director were the same as Vladimir Kozlov's. Turzbekova says that she was very happy to hear about Atabaev's release because she believes he is much more useful outside of prison. She, however, was concerned about Yermek Tursunov's behavior, who acted rude during the press conference and prevented any attempts by independent journalists to interpret the unexpected release of the renowned stage director. This inevitably raised a lot of questions, and Turzbekova now believes that Tursunov actually managed to save face for the committee rather than his friend. I believe that in this sense, Yermek Tursunov should be praised for showing the NSC's true nature. It's one thing when we say that NSC's investigative actions are held against established laws, and in response, the NSC and prosecutor's office say that everything is legal. But here we have a person who showed that it is quite possible to violate laws, and it is actually practiced. After all, a total stranger can apparently take part in all interrogations, even though it is not allowed by the criminal code. The website Respublica continues to publish letters of those arrested for inciting social hatred. This time, the reader was presented with translated diaries of Ruch Pentil club leader Jambalat Mamai. In them, he describes how he was taken out of his house by members of the NSC, placed in a chamber of the Almaty detention center, then transported to Aktau. In his notes, the young journalist writes about the conditions of his confinement, describing in detail the chamber where he was placed, as well as the people around him. He notes that in captivity, he and the now-released Bolat Atabaev are respected among inmates, and even some of the police operatives. Jean Bolat also writes, he came to the realization that prison deprives only physical freedom, and that it is impossible to put the mind behind bars. I heard that National Committee Arasha was set up to protect people like us, political prisoners. I want to thank people involved and my colleagues. I feel your support even in prison. I'm not afraid of prison. If the president's administration wants to have a youngest political prisoner, they can have me. All of this is done to intimidate young people. Fine, but they will fail to break the spirit of the young. After Nazarbayev's speech on social modernization of the country, the president's admi advisor, Yermukhamet Yertizbayev, took on the task of clarifying the situation with labor rights to ordinary citizens of Kazakhstan. Published this time in the newspaper Vreme, he once again accused the ex-banker Muhtar Ablazov of provoking labor conflicts in Janaozen and called director Balat Atabayev a careless citizen who had dared to challenge the state. In turn, union leaders maintain that local officials often become the cause of labor and social conflicts. President's advisor Yermukhamet Yertizbayev gave an interview to a national newspaper after the nation's leader published his article about 20 steps that can lead to social modernization. Unlike Nazarbayev, his aide says exactly who and what hampers the country's development. It was a labor conflict in Janozen between trade union of oil workers and the employer. Exiled banker Muhtar Ablazov appealed several times to oil workers via the internet, calling them to seize local administration structures and disobey state authorities in the capital and regions. Members of the political party Alga, pending registration, visited Janozen on several occasions with the goal of politicizing this conflict to the highest extent, distributing leaflets and inciting social hatred. Yertesbayev elaborated on the president's idea, saying that labor conflicts are inevitable. However, it is unacceptable to compare salaries, incomes and regions' development levels. Whoever does so is labeled provocateurs by the advisor. Trade unionists respond to this, saying that the opposition should not be blamed for everything. After all, in most cases, it is the officials and employers who start protracted disputes. Both trade unions and the opposition are citizens of Kazakhstan who are concerned about the future of our country. Governors also cause conflicts as they take decisions that contradict the legislation of Kazakhstan.
The head of the Labour Confederation of Kazakhstan is not surprised that the political advisor went on to talk about the headline-making Labour conflict. Murat Mashkinov says that public awareness on social issues in the country has dramatically risen after the tragedy in Zhenozhen. The December riots have triggered other issues such as massive and protracted oil strikes, helplessness of the trade unions' federation and accumulated discontent of key enterprises' staff. Unfortunately, in our country the mechanism of social dialogue does not work at all. If there had not been frequent conflicts in the oil industry, Kazakhmys or ArcelorMittal, no one would have paid attention to these problems. People who try to listen to and support oil workers are also mentioned in today's newspaper. Yertizbayev commented on the sensational release of the stage director Bulat Atabayev. The advisor hints that the authorities always supported the director and he repaid them with ingratitude, challenging the government. Some people may see Atabayev as the conscience of the nation, but for officials he is just a careless citizen. Atabayev himself explained why he chose to stand up for Janaus and residents, while the authorities kept ignoring their problems. The subject of Jean Ozen is fading away, but it must not be forgotten. It should be always there. I have moral responsibility for oil workers because I supported them, but now it seems that I'm forgetting about them too. For me, that seven-month-long strike is the embryo of civil society, the case of the protest culture formation. For the first time in Kazakhstan, people express their disagreements and mass. Their unity, mutual support and discipline is priceless. I saw something new and conscious in what had happened. In the meantime, outraged by Yertizbayev's dogmatic statements, public activist Jasar al Shalin decided to defend Atabayev. He says that no one has the right to tell Atabayev what to do and whether he should choose between politics and art. Yertizbayev is encroaching on a basic human and civil rights. What power does he have to curtain somebody's rights? It is Atabayev's own business whether to engage in politics or not, even if he left his job as a stage director. Both Nursultan Nazarbayev and his advisor's statements on labor relations lead observers to a conclusion that a new wave of repression is likely underway. Political opponents as well as trade unionists with overly active workers can end up under pressure. It may also cause some problems for employers and loyal oligarchs. The labor relations field is gradually turning into a zone controlled by the strong government machine. The advisor to the president made another confession on Wednesday, saying Kazakhstanians trust rumors more than reports by traditional media, because the information in the media is filtered and controlled. Coming from the ex-minister of information, the statement may prove to be worthwhile, say media rights defenders, adding that society believes more in kitchen conversations rather than official information. They say the blame lies on the government, which became too caught up by propaganda and agitation. On Wednesday, Yermuhamed Yertizbayev admitted what's been widely talked about in Kazakhstan for a while, making comments in Vreme newspaper about the case of Vladislav Chelok accused of killing his fellow border guards. The president's aide said that the population prefer rumors to the official reports. This happens because the traditional media is late with presenting the information, which is also frequently censored. We need to receive unbiased and reliable news quickly and timely. Every time the public wants to know something, but is getting vague explanations instead, rumors emerge. In general, when information is controlled and filtered, people trust rumors only. Yermuhamed Yertizbayev didn't explain who is controlling information in the mass media and why is it being filtered. Media expert Diana Kremova does it for him, saying that the authorities have no one but themselves to blame for citizens preferring social media and even rumors to the official information. After all, officials encourage all kinds of propaganda, mostly through state-owned outlets. Unfortunately, by trying too hard to shield the society from negativity, the authorities often block all the available information. This way we end up with state-run newspapers and TV channels as the sole source of information, while the public is looking for alternative sources and rumors, like on the Internet. Vladimir Rerik is a victim of propaganda forced upon by the Kazakh TV. Officially, Rerik's own show on the channel Habar was dropped due to low ratings. The journalist disagreed. The show's audience, no matter how small, included very intelligent and educated people. The real reason is different, says Redik, and adds that television nowadays needs half brains in both the audience and staff. The kind of a TV character who speaks for himself without using rehearsed text and prompters is not popular these days. Another kind is promoted instead, a propagandist or herald, you name it, a TV favorite. Any self-expression is deemed inappropriate. As my colleague Vladimir Pozna says, such are the days.
It seems like such days have also come for a once popular newspaper Vreme, along with the change of leadership at the news house. Yermukhamet Yertesbaev has also switched his allegiance. He chose Vreme to make his statements a newspaper which once mercilessly criticized the president's advisor. Media experts say that narrowing of the independent media market along with aggressive propaganda of government policy is today's reality. While this trend is gaining momentum, the population will hardly trust traditional media and stop believing rumors. Kazakh internet users discussed the future code of journalistic ethics proposed by President Nazarbayev. The new set of laws is set to appear in the fall of 2012. Despite the holiday, parliamentarian Mukhtar Tinikev joined in on the discussion with the following. Nursultan Nazarbayev instructed to modernize state media and draft a journalism ethics code that will leave many scribblers without a job. In response, journalists and bloggers introduced a Twitter hashtag DEPCODE, which stands for the code of a parliamentarian. Using it, internet users described in 140 symbols personal qualities they expect from the country's MPs. On Wednesday, the hashtag reached the top 30 list in the Russian Twitter segment. Media advocates have already identified the new code of journalistic ethics as an attempt to regulate the press. MPs must visit regions and work on solving problems of remote villages instead of discussing movies like Kairat the First Virgin. MPs must test all the laws they pass themselves. They should try to survive a month on $107 and then tell the people they are sorry for this humiliation. MPs should not just sit there at the sessions and vote yes on each bill. They also must think, argue, protect. Discussions on polygamy, renaming streets of cities as well as private life of citizens of Kazakhstan is considered by the MPs unethical. Prime Minister Karim Masimov is secretly traveling around the country. As reported by Aktobe regional newspaper Diapazon, the Prime Minister arrived in Aktobe on July 10th. A number of streets were closed and a large number of police officers was observed. Nothing is known about the goals of a premier's visit. His trip is not accompanied by press representatives and even the regular group of state journalists who usually follow officials were not invited to cover Masimov's trip. According to newspaper Diapazon, even the staff of governor's office was not informed about the purpose of the prime minister's visit, which was simply referred to as a working trip. In the meantime, the newspaper revealed that Masimov arrived to Aktobe from Kostanay after stopping in the North Kazakhstan region. According to some sources, the premier is expected in the Mangistau region and specifically in Aktau or Masimov's personal Twitter account also remains silent at the moment, with the last update from May 18th saying, tuning my Twitter account. 60 Shimken construction workers have been going without salaries for several years. They gathered once again in front of the Yaksarai shopping center that they had built with their own hands. Three years ago, a major shopping and entertainment center was supposed to have been built in Bozarik Micro District. Now this land plot is fenced off and it is impossible to get inside. For three years, people come to the construction site in vain, hoping to get their rightfully earned money. Construction workers already appeal to all possible authorities about their issue, alas to no avail. According to the agreement, the general contractor Hasier KZ Corporation was to pay its debt to the subcontractor, but the latter chairman was convicted and imprisoned for tax evasion. Kasyer will pay. They called me many times and we are in communication with them. But Kwadbekov is in prison for tax evasion. He gave me an ultimatum and a letter of attorney with the original copy, so that I got Kasyer to pay through court. Kwadbekov says he needs a paper saying we've been paid, which he'll give to the prosecutor's office. Karaganda doctors claim occupational diseases are directly dependent on the length of underground work. Miners are presented with the following arguments when trying to prove their diagnoses were earned while working in the lava. No disease can develop in less than 10 years of work. As a result, miners believe that doctors are simply protecting the interests of their employer, ArcelorMittal Timirtal, and they intend to complain to prosecutors. One of the workers, Vitaly Bichel, is not allowed inside the mine with his diagnosis, but doctors also refuse to confirm he has received an occupational disease. That would mean the employer would have to pay a timber's average salary, which is $1,000 a month. Vitaly earns a salary of 200 US dollars. He cannot support his wife and three children. Jaksalik Akbasov, a worker of the Lenin mine, found himself in a similar situation. Both men were sent to the National Center of Labor Hygiene and Occupational Diseases for Rehabilitation. The facility specialist can also identify health damage, but can only do so when patients have a special appointment card. The miners cannot obtain it, hence why they plan to appeal to the public prosecutors. 
I had an appointment with Dr. Sisukev, a clinical surgeon. He said in his report that I need surgery, not treatment, as it does not help me. Why do our doctors lobbying the employer's interests send us somewhere for rehabilitation? Now they just want to relieve the employer of all the responsibility for my condition. I am given an easier job with a meager pay of 200 US dollars. My family will suffer as a result. Why should it suffer for this? If they do have a definite diagnosis of occupational disease, then there must be an appointment card, either from their place of residence or from the guild doctor. In this case, they are sent to the National Center to identify health damage and obtain the status of professional patients. The famous Kazakh poet Mukhtar Sharkhanov recalled the subject of miners and oilmen strikes at an online conference on Radio Azatik's website. Kazakh citizens asked a range of political and cultural questions. Shakhanov also spoke about Jano Zen events and compared them with the youth uprising of 1986 in Almaty. He expressed the desire to find out the truth behind the tragedy in the oil town and emphasized that such opportunity is unlikely to come up with the current authorities in place. Shakhanov also expressed his support to civil activists who became victims of the system for supporting oil workers. In my opinion, we won't know the truth until the authorities will be replaced. They will prevent us from finding out. As for Balata Tabarj and Balat Mamai and other people, they are suffering for trying to find out the truth. Therefore, we will always keep supporting them. But I believe that we will eventually get to the truth. Recently, the poet and public figure celebrated his 70th anniversary. The evening dedicated for this occasion was organized in his hometown of Shemkent. However, he failed to receive any birthday greetings from the president's administration. More details next. Shimkent officials presented a traditional coat as a gift to famous Kazakhstan poet Mukhtar Shakhanov, who just turned 70. To celebrate the birthday, Shimkent authorities organized a special recital event. The poet, however, did not receive any greetings from the Astana, which spent three days celebrating the president's birthday and the day of the city. The poet's name drew public attention for the first time in the 1970s and a decade later he was actively engaged in politics. Shakhanov established a movement to save the vanishing Aral Sea. In the 90s, the activist was considered the leader of national patriots. During the last parliamentary elections, Shakhanov helped to improve the chances of a weakened party, Ruhaniyat. Another politician, Mukhtar Taizhan, followed his older colleague and joined the Greens. Although the party was later removed from the race, Taizhan believes that Shakhanov still has political power. We know what happened to Aron Altenbeck and Zamanbek. The government has a different approach when it comes to dealing with authoritative individuals among Kazakh people. Shakhanov understands this. The authorities may react in a very unpredictable way. So if he will be even more active, the government may respond differently since he is a very influential man. Mukhtar Shakhanov's colleague Smagul Yelubai calls him the nation's defender for his actions during the Soviet times and after the country gained independence. Any big initiative involves nationwide movements. For example, the political rehabilitation of Zhaltoksan events participants was a tremendous initiative. Of course, Mukhtar wouldn't be able to do it alone. But things like that always need a great public speaker and Shakhanov accepted the role, a decision for which we are very thankful. The event is called a manifestation of Kazakh nationalism. You can blame the 10, 50,000 people, 100,000 people, but you cannot blame the entire Kazakh people for being nationalistic. This session speech made Shakhanov a national hero. He was heading the commission to investigate the events of December 1986. Nevertheless, civil activist Hasen Koja Akhmetov has been trying to unmask the poet for many years. At the end of June, Koja Akhmetov took a legal action against Shakhanov for slender. Maybe Nazarbayev keeps silent because he doesn't want to expose his old agent by congratulating him with an anniversary, while we are trying to unmask him and litigating with him. According to civil activist Koja Akhmetov, Shakhanov still remains insincere with people. All his national patriotic ideas are just well-planned campaigns drafted by the president's administration. Last year, right before the elections, he raised an issue of the state language, but not for the sake of Kazakh, and just to scare the Russian-speaking population of Kazakhstan and force it into supporting Nazarbayev. The idea was to scare people with Kazakhs who might come to power and create problems if Nazarbayev steps down. Therefore, it was vital to keep him in power. The poet prefers not to speak about this topic during his birthday and views all accusations as provocations. Everything that was told by Hasien is a lie. Real men wouldn't say such things. In my opinion, someone is intentionally trying to mar my reputation by bringing this up on my birthday.
The controversy around the December events in Mukhtar Shahanov's role have been around for more than a decade. The poet, however, doesn't want any involvement in it. Shahanov is not upset with the authorities that forgot about his 17th anniversary, saying the memory of the people is far more important. On Wednesday, 3,000 copies with Abai Konanbaev's poems were published by Moscow Publishing House. Part of them will be sent to Kazakh bookstores. This is already the second publication of Abai's poems in the last months, which is being sold successfully in the Russian capital. More details in the next report. On Wednesday, the test run of 3,000 copies of Abai Kunanbaev's poems collection appeared in Moscow stores. The reason for such popularity is seen right on the book cover. There could be no other book cover. As soon as we saw the T-shirt with Occupy by imprint, we immediately decided to have it as a cover. The spring Occupy by rallies helped establish Abai not only as Kazakh but also a Russian national poet. Publisher Pavel personally attended Occupy by events and decided to publish the book. Initially, this was produced as a goodwill project, but now it has a commercial base. For Mikhail, the active member of the Occupy movement, the book is a reminder of past events and also a piece of memorabilia. He says it would have been quite handy back then as many people were reciting poems about freedom and fairness of the protest. Now he is no longer an unknown poet. Mikhail, a future engineer, wouldn't comment on Abai's poetry. It's not the rhyme, but the meaning of poems that counts, he says. Just recently, Abai became not simply a name, but a symbol of good and fair protest for Moscovites. In the five minutes it took to discuss Abai and politics, someone brought flowers to the poet's monument. We are from Kazakhstan ourselves, but we didn't hear about Occupy Abai movement. It's good our poet received this exposure and recognition. This book from the test run will be the first to reach Kazakhstan, although thousands of copies will be available in bookstores very soon. It's a buy with a white ribbon, the symbol of Russian civil rights and fair elections movement. Historical monuments are to be washed in Kazakhstan by Univeller company. The cleanups were already held in three cities, including Almaty, Karaganda, and Shymkent. Around 70 people were involved in the campaign. Monuments of Astana are on the way, and volunteers will arrive there on July 14th to wash the monument for Sakyan Seifulin. Three monuments to Aliya Moldagulova miners and Kabanai Batir were washed in Almaty, Shimkent and Karaganda respectively. We are happy that many people came to support their idea after a working day. They are in no way related to the company or the campaign organizers. Modern jazz will be performed on Thursday by an American jazz band Shamar Allen and the Underdogs, who visit Kazakhstan for the second time. Musicians already performed in Shimkent and Taraz. The next stop is Almaty. Shamar Alien, the band's lead singer, says that southerners were impressed by the concert and surprisingly more people showed up than was expected. The guest singer hopes to have the same success in Almaty. The band plays jazz fused with hip-hop, funk and soul. The music has a clear New Orleans vibe. Shamar Alien, the trumpet player, claims that even the US President Barack Obama is among his fans. The audience in Shimkent was very impressed with the musician's skills. Funniest incident just happened to me in Shimkent. We were... Uh, doing a show from fountain, water fountain, mm -hmm. like water fountains around the stage mm -hmm. that we performed on. Mm -hmm. So I ran out and was dancing mm -hmm. and started walking around the water fountain and fell in. <laughs> <laughs> fell in the, the water, point. yeah. <laughs> this is all we have time for now. Thank you for watching. Goodbye.